All right. Welcome everyone to the latest monthly EFF Austin meetup. My name is Kevin Welch. I'm the current president of the board at EFF Austin. For those of you who are new to our meetup, and it looks like we have some new faces, though a lot of familiar old faces. For those of you who are new, EFF Austin is a long-standing digital civil liberties organization in Austin, Texas. In fact, John, we're really pushing up on our uh, 30th anniversary here, aren't we? That's right. Um, but yeah, we're almost 30 years old. Mm -hmm. um, we were founded alongside the events that gave birth to Electronic Frontier Foundation in San Francisco. Electronic Frontier Foundation is the nation's foremost digital civil liberties advocacy organization. If you've never heard of them, you can basically think of them as the ACLU for the internet and emerging digital technologies but they fight for various good things to try to protect your rights in emerging technological spaces. Um, you know, making sure that um, there's end-to-end -end encryption without back doors in it, uh, protecting Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act to try to preserve free speech online, and all sorts of cool, interesting, very tech nerdy legalese work. It's they're awesome people and you should donate to them. If you have a lot of money, you should also donate to us, but always uh, prioritize <laughs> EFF if funds are short. If you did ever feel so inclined to give us a donation, we have a PayPal link right on our website. Um, so I'm gonna hand things over to our monthly speaker in a sec here, but I'm going to give you all a few announcements about things we are doing and working on right now. And, um, and I also, if uh, anybody in the community would like to share in just a sec, that will be the time for that as well. Um, so first thing, um, so we usually do these meetups about once a month, currently on the second Tuesday of every month at 7 p.m. They've traditionally been in meat space at Capital Factory downtown, um, but for the time being, since we've been able to run them just as well as normal virtually, we feel no pressure to return to meat space until events improve. So they will continue to be here in our Zoom room that Capital Factory has graciously provided us for the time being. Um, our next meetup in December, we're going to be very lucky to be hearing from uh, Dr. Sharon Strover at UT. She's going to be talking to us about, she runs a research unit at UT that's been doing a lot of research into online disinformation campaigns, and she's going to be sharing some of the latest findings of her research with us at our December meetup. So, you know, that fixes to probably be pretty dang interesting. I was on a uh, panel with her right before the COVID happened at um, one of um, our local library branches talking about uh, disinformation stuff. And uh, a lot of what she had to share was uh, pretty dang fascinating. So I recommend if that is an issue that is of interest to you, which I think it is of interest to almost all of us these days, regardless of where we lie on the ideological spectrum, I would recommend uh, checking that out. Um, we're also going to be, she's the only uh, formal meetup we have scheduled at this point, but we have a number of people potentially in conversations uh, for talks next year. If you're an interesting person and would like to give a talk next year, get at me. I will need speakers. Also, if you know interesting people, you should uh, suggest they do a talk. Um, let's see. We've also recently launched kind of a second um, not necessarily monthly, it's more a bi-monthly uh, series currently um, that's basically going to be a virtual book club. Um, it's being run on the first and third Thursdays of every month at 7 p.m. in our Zoom room. You can check all our social media channels for more information. That is being uh, curated and run by EFF Austin board member David Hensley, um, which basically means that much like you can always expect my face at these because I run and curate these but you won't necessarily given the month see other board members. You can always expect David to be at the book club and leading that, though I'm going to try to pop in to all the ones I can make. Um, currently, um, the first book that has been chosen for the club is, um, yeah, I'll give you tired, it is The Rise of Big Data Policing, Surveillance, Race, and the Future of Law Enforcement. So that is the current book being discussed. For those of you who are like, oh, that sounds awesome, but I'm busy and reading sounds hard. Reading is not a requirement to attend the book club meetings. 
um, there will be at least one person, David, who has read the book, who will always be there and will be leading discussion. And we encourage you to read the book by all means, but um, you should attend anyway, even if you're not, if the topic is of interest to you, or you'd just like to sit there and listen to people who have read the book discuss the topic. Um, we encourage you to attend. The assigned reading for the next one, which will be not this Thursday, but next Thursday, the assigned reading is chapters two, Data is the New Black, The Lure of Data and Driven Policing, and chapter three, Whom We Police, Person-Based Predictive Targeting. I will also drop a link to the book in New York University Press. You also can easily find the book for purchase on Amazon. The paperback is not that expensive. So you have options of obtaining it if that sounds of interest to you. But this has been something we've been wanting to do for a long time and thought would be a nice additional piece of programming we could offer in the COVID times. So uh, hopefully that sounds of interest and some of you will want to check it out. That is probably the uh, main new event we have spun up recently. Um, a few other things uh, we are currently working on that I will continue to raise and bring to people's attention. Um, we are continuing to try to collect uh, signatures for our petition with the help of EFF to go before Austin City Council to work on getting, um, you know, at the very least, strict regulations, if not an outright ban, on the use of facial recognition by law enforcement in the city of Austin. Um, we've got about 100 signatures. We could use more because it would probably be nice to have at least several hundred before we talk to council about this, make a more credible case. So I'm going to drop a link to where you can sign the petition in chat here in a second. But if it's some, a cause that resonates with you, you should sign it and share your friends to sign it because we, um, we really believe strongly in this issue and we think politically the time is right to push on this issue. So if it's something you care about, um, you help the cause by signing that because it gives our argument more credibility because we can point to citizen engagement on this issue. Uh, let's see, what else, what else? We will probably be trying to do a virtual uh, holiday party of some kind. We usually yearly do a holiday party where we gather in person at a number of bars that we usually congregate in Austin. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, thanks, Nash, for sharing the link. Really appreciate it. I didn't. I just noticed you're here, Nash. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, for those who don't know, Nash is an organizer <laughs> at EFF, so we are being joined tonight. <laughs> um, so, um, as I said, we usually do a holiday party. Um, in the physical space, um, that's obviously not happening this year. It would be hard to impossible to figure out a way to do it safely that everyone would be comfortable with. So uh, if we do one, it'll probably be a virtual one in our Zoom room that you'd be welcome to join. I'm going to be hashing out with our board member, Maggie Duvall, ideas on fun things we may or may not do. I mean, the lowest bar will just be, it will be a place during the holiday season for you all to hang out with this community and chat. So at the bare minimum, that's what it'll be. But we've had a few other ideas. Our board member, Ritika, is actually an aspiring DJ. So we might actually get a holiday party DJ set out of her. So, you know, we're going to try to make some lemonade from the lemons of this year. So stay tuned for that. We're going to be trying to figure that out here. Um, let me think. Oh, cross promotion. So our board member and um, co-founder John Lebkowski uh, also has a side venture where he is um, working on an online uh, podcast um, where they interview various people with his friend Scoop, who is also here tonight, and our board member Maggie Duvall called Putopia News Network. Um, they do a lot of cool interviews, including many faces who have been at EFF Austin meetups. Um, they have a number of cool things coming up. I know they're going to be interviewing Corey Doctorow about his new book here soon, so um, you should check that one out. And John, no, and another another board member, Heather Barfield. Yes, or is she still a board member? Yeah. Uh, yeah yes. Yes. So she's going to be our guest for our live stream, which we do on Facebook every Thursday from seven to eight. Yep, that I, that I believe that was the case. I was going to just double check with you. But yes, so our board member Heather is going to be discussing um, 
not it's not necessarily in the EFF Austin wheelhouse, though it will probably overlap because it's just going to be a discussion about the role of gatekeepers in organizational hierarchies, which given that EFF Austin is a digital community, um, it's certainly a topic of tangential interest to us at least. But that should be interesting and I encourage you to check it out. Uh, let's see, do I have any things that I still need to bring to you all's attention that I have not talked about yet? I think I've hit all the major things we are working on right now. Um, I mean, well, there's, there's, I can tell you, I'm not going to go into details because we're still hashing this out with the parties, but we are currently also uh, chatting with aides to city council about some um, digital civil liberties issues related to certain um, grants and requisitions going on with the Austin Police Department right now. I'm not going, I don't want to talk too much about it publicly right now since we're just still having private discussions and trying to steer the conversation, but I just wanted to let the community know that we are continuing to and try to increase our engagement with city council and advocate on issues that matter to this community. So I just wanted to raise that. Um, um, now we'll quickly turn it over to the room and see if anybody has anything they would like to share with the community. Shameless self-promotion is totally okay, as long as it is something you think people who are in the digital civil liberties community might be interested in. So if you have any announcements you want to make, uh, now's the time. I'll uh, go. Oh, yeah, sure. I, uh, I'm Jim, I work for the uh, Tor Project. And we're going to be doing a live stream event um, Monday. Oh, what time? Let's see, 1600 UTC, which I think is 10 or 11 Central. I'll paste the link in the chat. Um, but we'll be talking a lot about um, probably a little bit of overview of Twitter itself, if you're not familiar, and a lot about uh, what we've done over the last year and what we plan to do next year. So it should be interesting. Well, that's awesome. And may I just also say that if anybody from the tour project would ever come like to speak at the meetup about current goings on in the tour world, um, by all means, uh, we'd love to have you. We're all big fans of the tour project. Uh, cool. Thanks. Anybody else got uh, interesting goings on they would like to share before we get started? No? Cool. All right. Um, Oh, oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. I was raising my hand politely. Um, Sorry. <laughs> I'll, I'll be noisier. Um, hi, this is Jennifer, um, and I work at the Austin History Center, and I just wanted to make a super quick pitch for people to keep um, us in mind when you're um, thinking about throwing stuff away um, that has to do with, you know, advocating for our police to be more equitable or... Um, doing any kind of advocacy work here in Austin or any kind of um, other stuff you do here in Austin. Um, I just want to encourage people to think of themselves as um, being part of history, and, which people don't think of sometimes. And um, just let us know if you um, think you might have something that we might be interested in, because people come and ask us, you know, how did the last interaction with advocacy groups in Austin and the police department play out you know journalists contact us and if we have stuff we give it to them and they um can fill out our historical um uh record and if not um then they don't have anything to go on so um keep us in mind thank you thank you so much i will actually keep that in mind for if there's anything that eff austin could send you absolutely and i will also just say that um if anybody from the austin history center would ever like to come speak to us about the history of um goings on in our space in Austin via digital civil liberties, activism, just history of tech, any interesting stuff you guys have, we'd love to hear from you. Super. I'll keep it, I'll uh, look what and see what I can find. <laughs> I will plop my email in the chat for anybody who wants to shoot me an email about anything we've discussed here. Cool. All right. Um, well, if we don't have any other announcements, we'll get started here. And I'll also just say that um, probably the way we're going to want this to go is if you have questions, um, I'm going to encourage you to let John finish his talk before we get to questions, unless John views this. Sometimes we have talks that are more roundtable discussions, but I think John has more of a prepared talk. So. I'm going to encourage you to hold your questions until he finishes his main talk. Um, you can certainly put them in the chat 
and we'll then go through them when we get to the question portion, which usually is a pretty free form discussion once we get to that portion. But um, if you have a question, just plop it in the chat. I'm also going to encourage all of you, though it was like most of you know the drill, um, keep your mic muted, you know, just so we don't have too much crosstalk chatter noise. You're welcome to have your video on, though it is also optional. You don't have to have your video on. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker for this meetup. Well, our speaker is somebody with a very long, intimate, illustrious connection to EFF Austin, John Lipkowski. He is the only current member of the board that goes all the way back to the uh, founding of the organization. He served in various roles of co-founder, of president, of vice president, um, and board member. Uh, all throughout our almost 30 year history, we would not be here without John's tireless work and advocacy. And we are happy that he still continues to give us a slice of his time when I'm sure he could think of a lot of other ways he could use his time. So we're very happy. I'm not sure it was completely tireless. <laughs> I might have been tired a few times. I, well, I definitely get tired, so I'm sure you did and do. <laughs> um, so John has been an integral part of our organization's history and continues to serve on the board. He's been involved in, you know, the popularization of the internet since near the beginning. He has met and interviewed and been friends with many luminaries uh, in the digital civil liberties space. Um, yeah, he's, he knows a lot of cool people and knows a lot of cool stuff. So we figured I'm the zealot of the internet. <laughs> you kind of are actually, from what I can mm -hmm. tell. Um, to that end, we usually have John, you know, at least once every couple of years, kind of give us sort of, you know, usually a futurist bent talk where John will bring his considerable breadth of knowledge from a bunch of different areas relevant to the electronic frontier to sort of wax rhapsodic about where he, the internet's been and where he sees it going and just, you know, the larger sort of philosophical implications of the internet on society and, you know, and what it means for people's rights and how they live in society. So, um, and I guess, you know, I'll, um, and then I guess, um, and I've already mentioned his work with Potopia News Network. You know, he's had a number of cool jobs over the years. He helped Whole Foods Market get online back in the 90s. He's done a lot of cool stuff. But uh, John, to give an intro into John's talk for you tonight, um, well, there's certain topics that have been very much on all of our minds at the EFF Austin board recently. And sort of the idea for this talk sprung out of a kind of freewheeling conversation a lot of the board had a while back where we were just discussing the current epistemological state of the internet or basically how nobody seems to agree on what the truth is anymore or even yeah, the, the word what, dystopia comes to mind nobody agrees on what the truth is anymore or even how we could figure that out or who sources of authority to learn the truth are and you know it's easy to fall back on simple partisan reflexes of those people are stupid but you know i think most of us at the board recognize that there's something deeper and potentially far more problematic for the future of society going on here than simple partisan questions so john decided to give us a talk that's basically going to springboard from considering the 1960s phrase question authority in the light of the 21st century evolution of the internet as a platform for all media. The key questions we're going to be considering in John's talk and in the discussion that follows are, are we still questioning authority or have we lost all sense of an authority for truth? What's been the impact of blogging and disruptive social media on our perception of the world? How do we find consensus about what's real? And why would that be important? Without further ado, why don't you take it away, John? All right. Let's see here. Everybody see that? Good. All right. Yeah, so Kevin's correct. We, we were discussing this, and the question of authority thing def definitely came to mind with me. Um, and I was sort of thinking about that, meditating on it, and I came up with some ideas that I've been working on. Uh, there may be a little bit of drift from where we were in that conversation to where I am now. And I just want to say that this is a kind of a work in progress. So um, 
I guess I want to lower expectations. The, the, the work that I have here, the work that I've done, I consider sort of partially done. I'm still thinking about it, but I have put together a set of slides to make it a little easier on your eyes and give you something to follow. And, uh, and actually it looks like, there we go. <clears throat> so who am I and why should you listen to me? Uh, this is a talk based on my informed perspective, and that really means it's my perspective. In other words, the experiences I've gone through, the things that I've seen, the things that I've read, uh, and certainly the contacts that I've had over the years. Uh, when I first uh, came onto the internet, um, I had no idea what was ahead of me, but um, I was mostly interested in the concept of online community that people could gather online and have conversations. And uh, I was uh, a big fan and advocate of uh, the Whole Earth uh, catalog and, and Coevolution Quarterly, the, the quarterly they were publishing for several years that later became Whole Earth Review and Whole Earth Magazine. Um, I wanted to write for them. I wanted to be involved with the catalog in some way. And uh, I found out that they had started an online community. We, we called them a bulletin board system back then, a BBS. Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with that term. But really, basically, it was uh, a computer is set up and you load software on it that allows people to, to post comments and then post comments on those comments. And that becomes a conversation. And of course, that's all very familiar to us now because we've experienced it in so many ways. Um, uh, through m joining the well, uh, I found my way to the internet because not long after I joined the well, I think just after, they connected it to the internet. And I also met uh, some people through, when I got on the well, I met the people who were putting together the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And then when we started something here in Austin uh, that was going to be like the initial or alpha chapter of EFF, um, I met uh, a guy named John Quarterman who was an internet consultant and who taught me uh, a lot about internet technology and also about Unix, uh, which was uh, a common platform at the time and the well was on a Unix platform. Uh, so learning Unix uh, gave me some power I didn't have before in finding my way around. And, and the experience that I had after that led me to, uh, we started a, a company called Fringeware and uh, our idea was that um, we could be, bring products online, products that it was hard for people to bring to market and maybe sell them online. That turned out to be a little before its time. Uh, we actually couldn't accept credit cards at the time we were talking about this. The banks wouldn't let us do it. Uh, but we did, we started a, uh, what was going to be a catalog and became a magazine or a zine uh, in the terminology of the time. Um, we had both been involved with a, another zine called Boing Boing, uh, where I, we were both editors. And uh, I had also been involved with Fact Sheet 5, which was a, a zine that reviewed other zines. Um, eventually, I got involved with South by Southwest, um, uh, initially covering it. Uh, covered it the first time I went to South by Southwest, I was covering it for Mondo 2000, which was a magazine I wrote for some. Uh, EFF Austin, of course, was something that started in 91, and we um, connected that with Fringeware and also with the robot group. Uh, I don't have this on my list here, but we had, uh, there, were some, uh, there was an event called RoboFest where all three of us were involved in it, all three organizations. Um, I did go to work for Whole Foods Market to help them uh, do e-commerce, uh, which they did for a while. Uh, I wrote features for the Austin Chronicle, mostly about technology. I became uh, 
part of actually through Bruce Sterling, who started something called the Viridian Design Movement. One thing that spun off from that was a blog called World Changing that was a pretty happening blog for a few years. And I was involved with that. And we were mostly focused on sustainability and climate change, but other things too. It was sort of, it was similar actually to the approach of, of whole earth. And then uh, in the early 2000s, I got involved uh, in discussions of using this technology for politics and uh, co-edited a book called Extreme Democracy. Um, I, in the mid aughts, I led a project or I managed a project at IC Squared Institute here in town called Wireless Future, which was uh, uh, really an economic development project for wireless companies in Austin uh, to promote kind of the future of wireless. Back then, you know, you didn't have people carrying cell phones around. Um, you know, Wi-Fi existed, but but this it was very early. We actually had another project we did with Rich McKinnon, who was a former president of BFF Austin, um, called um, um, let's see, what do we call it? Austin Wireless City. And w with that project, uh, we had people walking around and recruiting various businesses to add Wi-Fi, uh, and seeing this as an approach that could. Uh, get a fairly pervasive presence for Wi-Fi throughout the city. And it was actually pretty successful. That's how uh, Wi-Fi really started to spread in Austin. Um, and then uh, I was involved with something called the Digital Convergence Initiative, which uh, led indirectly, and it's a longer story than I can tell right now, but it led indirectly to the formation of Plutopia Productions, and the big Plutopia events that we did at South by Southwest for several years. And that was Maggie Duvall and Bon Davis, Derek Woodgate and I um, had that as a company where we were going to do those kinds of uh, uh, like big events uh, for a while, but we, uh, we, we didn't sustain it very long. Those big events turned out to be very expensive events. Um, and um, overall, just throughout my life, I've been influenced a lot by pop culture. Some people are, you know, will say that they've read the classics and that they're steeped in, um, in, in an academic path that's fairly traditional. But I was very non-traditional and very much interested in, in contemporary culture. And also, I became interested in strategic foresight. Uh, futurist thinking and uh, also I was influenced by a Buddhist practice which I think kind of comes into the thinking behind this presentation. So I'm going to start by mentioning this book that I read. So we were talking about question authority was something that people were saying in the 60s and, and uh, yeah, Timothy Leary didn't exactly coin the term but he popularized it and people were putting bumper stickers on their car that said that and so forth. And uh, I don't know how well people thought about what it meant, but we knew that there were, there, there was a sense that there was some authority out there that was potentially oppressive and, and was making decisions that we didn't completely agree with and starting wars. And, you know, I mean, obviously the, uh, I was a hippie back then, and and a bunch of us were uh, uh, brought up through an era where we were protesting the Vietnam War, but we were protesting a lot of other things too. And part of it was we were just protesting what we referred to as the establishment, that we protested without any deep understanding of what we were protesting, but we 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 just had the sense that something wasn't working. And that kind of uh, uh, dissent can be weaponized, which I think we'll get to later. Um, but there was a book that I found out about through a professor named Rod Bell, who taught a government course at, at UT. Um, I was in his class and he talked a lot about this book, The Social Construction of Reality by uh, Berger and Luckman. And uh, I'm not going to get into this book or explain exactly what it was about. You see a little text there that uh, 
is actually from Wikipedia that kind of explains what the book was about. But the main point here is uh, it was a very obvious thing at the time. Yes, reality is a product of consensus. It's socially constructed. Uh, the way that we see reality kind of comes out of our collective imagination. And that's an important, that was, a, that was an important insight for me, but I think that's an important insight broadly for everybody to learn and share that, that what we think of as established, what we think of as real uh, is constantly emerging from a collective consensus about what's real. And that's really become a big deal lately, and we'll get to that. Um, I want to start now by talking about uh, the role of media. Um, having to move these pictures around here. So media uh, collectively refers to all the broadcasting and publishing and now the internet uh, concerns. And uh, collective communication really, which, which is what the media, the, inter, the media represents is a kind of collective communication uh, originally or in the mass media era, era very top down. It drives our consensus about what's real uh, or it did for a long time anyway. So, so, you know, you had mass media, mass communication uh, sort of, facilitating and supporting the distribution of concepts, ideas, beliefs, and social models that we were all sort of carrying around in our heads. And governments and political organizations also learned in the era of mass media to leverage media to create systems of belief that worked for them and to catalyze social norms. Now it's important, I wanna mention here because we're gonna come back to this later, it's important to see another thing that has that we've seen throughout the evolution of media, and that's this comes from Samuel Taylor Coleridge in 1817, but he talked about the suspension of disbelief, and that is when you're when you're let's say you're reading a fictional work, you suspend your disbelief in a, in order to really get into the fiction. So we start to kind of accept fictions. We accept perceptions of reality that people have dreamed up that they've conveyed to us through books or writings or movies or whatever. And uh, the fact that, that we learn to suspend our disbelief, I think is kind of relevant to where we are now. And I'm gonna come back around to that. Um, but first, I want to talk about how the internet works as a uh, platform for media and the, the history of media being from spoken word initially to printed word to published word from images uh, in a cave to to published images. Um, and then, you know, over time, this evolves into mass media. The printing press is sort of like a first way to to distribute mass media. but eventually we have like radio television film and uh through the era of mass media of the last century we had a very scarce means of production and that that limits the sources of media and given those limited sources that are sort of sending media out to be distributed broadly you could vet media and control the messages that were being carried through media and I think we all understand that pretty well now. And, and we know that back then, um, the messages coming through media, and especially what we referred to as news, was heavily vetted and managed and fact-checked. Now, and as an interim between the era of mass media and uh, the internet, personal computers popped up, and we had something like called desktop publishing where uh, a small operator, somebody without that much money, could actually create a publication on a personal computer, which was relatively low cost, and get that printed and distributed. And I mentioned zines earlier. That's where zines came from. You had people who had always wanted to 
be involved with a magazine and suddenly they could just make their own magazine. So there were suddenly a bunch of zines popping up all over the place. And that was a first move in a direction of a sort of like uh, fragmentation of media uh, uh, conception and distri distribution. And then the internet comes along and changes everything. Uh, the World Wide Web starts with a page model that's very much like traditional publishing, but it's got something called hypertext. And hypertext is very revolutionary. You can like embed a link in some text and have it linked to other text. So again, the internet changes everything. So you've got the low cost of publishing. Uh, eventually there's a higher cost of gaining attention. And we see that now. But the other thing that happened uh, as the internet started to appear and evolve was it activated and enabled fringes, like fringe thinkers, people who um, were not really connected to mainstream thinking. They had a way to, to make their, their voices be heard uh, through the internet. They might have a smaller audience, but they were able to kind of get the word out. And, uh, you know, the, the fringeware thing, the idea that we had was uh, in every little town across the country, across the world, maybe there, there are people who kind of don't think like other people do, and they can't find people who think like them locally. But on the internet, they can find communities of people who are maybe closer to their, their beliefs. So that was kind of an interesting impact of the internet that we, we saw early on. Um, and we also saw that there was, a, over time, there was a diminishing commitment to vetted sources, the kind of media sources that we had seen before. Suddenly you've got all these bloggers starting to blog. There's a balkanization of perspective and belief. And there's this great petri dish for propaganda. So the internet grew from being an R&D network, this is internet history basically, to mainstreaming over the first few years, like se first seven years of, of internet mainstreaming, which, you know, I think people commonly agree that 1993 was a turning point. The, the web appeared in 92 and was starting to be adopted in 93. And then at some point you had people actually trying to to build higher end publications online and they started creating content management systems, CMS as we refer to them. And these big content management systems, which could be big and expensive back then, were, were a way to publish content, uh, just kind of pour content into a framework and easily publish it, uh, at least more easily than having to code every page, page by page. We also saw uh, an ascendance and evolution of virtual community, more and more people coming together online, having conversations with each other. Some communities were built around blogs and some were, were built around platforms like the well that I've already mentioned or Echo in New York or um, uh, MindVox. There were several places where people would gather and, and, and talk. Um, uh, all of this started to have an impact on media production, of course, um, especially published media. And this was kind of a going concern and there was a lot of activity around it. I was part of something called Electric Minds, which Howard Rheingold started. It was built, it was very similar to The Well, uh, but it was supposed to be a for-profit community. And, those of us who were involved, we would, we would write articles for it. And then we built discussion groups around, in my case, or it was around Austin. It was a whole new way of doing things really. And there were a bunch of these things popping up. And then we had the dot-com bust in 2000. Um, there had been a lot of money going into internet company stocks. And there were a lot of advertisers who were spending a lot of money on internet publications. Um, and what they found was that they were getting an inaccurate representation of, of 
what their money was buying them. You said, oh, you got thousands of hits for the money that you gave us. But, you know, each one of every internet page, the web page that loaded was a bunch of different hits. Each image was a hit, you know. So the, the hit counts were, were inflated somewhat. Advertisers started to kind of uh, question whether the internet was really, uh, or these internet companies were doing that much for them. And they were kind of backing off. And that's how the money uh, kind of started going away. And there was a concern that uh, internet companies were overvalued and eventually there was kind of a collapse uh, of internet stocks. Uh, and that was in 2000. I was in the middle of a big project with Whole Foods then that they just decided to abandon. And it was mainly because of this bust. So in, in 2000, you got a bunch of people who had been working for internet publications uh, and building technologies for the internet. And they don't have big companies around anymore willing to pay them a lot of money. And some of those people started building smaller, lighter content management systems, personal content management systems. So you have stuff like Blogger and WordPress appearing. Actually, WordPress was built by really, really young guys down in Houston. Uh, and, uh, but Blogger was uh, um, kind of the first big blog platform that came along. There was... Uh, yeah, I can't remember the name of it. There was oh, Live Journal. There was also Live Journal for people who were doing more like journals. That was um, where me and all my friends were initially. Yeah, right on. Live Journal had a, a a large and vibrant community. And then social networks in the '90s, there was something called Six Degrees that kind of created a model for social network sites. Um, six degrees didn't survive. In fact, I think it went away in 2000, but in the same year, 2000 rise appeared, which was a, uh, a social network for like people who wanted to do business networking. And it was created by somebody who noticed that business networking events did real well. So maybe a business networking system would do well. And incidentally, the thing that really, I think drove an increase in interest and activity here was the fact that digital photos were starting to be a thing. And Rise was the first place I remember going to where I could see pictures of the people that I knew on the internet. You remember on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. Well, we found out, you know, who was a dog and who wasn't at that point. And then uh, we had Friendster appeared, which was originally supposed to be more of a dating site, but it became a kind of a more generic social network. And then uh, a guy at Google had built a social network site called Orkut. That was his first name. Uh, Orkut was rolled out and was really popular for a while. And then Facebook. Facebook had been um, mostly available to people at, in various colleges. They were opening up to campuses. So they they had a pretty slow rollout going campus by campus, but eventually they opened themselves up to everybody. I, I got remember, read it in. Yeah, I just was going to say, I remember when it was just college campuses because I was in college at the time. Um, hmm. It was a big deal when they let it be for non-college people. It certainly was. And we had a lot of conversations about Facebook after they opened up. And every time I said, man, they've really screwed up. There's no way they'll survive this. They fixed it and survived. So look where they are now. Um, Reddit is not really a traditional social network. It's really closer to being kind of like the well, a conversation space. It was mainly a place to post links and talk about them. And um, it gathered a lot of uh, attention in mass. Um, and then microblogging came along. Twitter uh, famously became a big thing at South by Southwest here in Austin one year when they we're promoting it heavily there and people were starting to use it mainly to coordinate like meeting around town during South by Southwest. And that really put them on the map. And of course they just grew and grew from there. There's Tumblr. There's eventually the growth of what Bruce Sterling refers to as the stacks, which are these vertically integrated media empires like Google and Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon is who he's talking about there. And those all started becoming really, really successful. 
in 2007, the iPhone appears and uh, smart devices, which we sort of anticipated. I was working on Wireless Future in 2005, and we did a wireless track at South by Southwest that year. Um, and uh, part of what we were talking about was how this, this is coming, you know, eventually people are going to be walking down the street accessing the internet through devices they're carrying with them. We weren't exactly sure how that was going to work at that point, but, but it, you know, we could see it coming very clearly. And it's at this point when kind of everybody can get their hands on a device. When you go from those weird flip phones to having a phone that's got a screen and can show you pictures, you know, show you video. Attention was moving online at that point. And that's what people were paying attention to. Oh my God. I hope nobody here has a seizure disorder. <laughs> Wait a minute. Let's see. I think I can stop that thing. I thought I could. Anyway, so attention gets really promiscuous here not focused much anymore. Everybody's getting pretty ADD. It's fragmented across many media. It's sold to advertisers. You become the product, your attention anyway. And of course, attention is also how you get into our hearts and minds. And it has something to do with how we construct reality. It's kind of based on what we pay attention to, what we're letting in. And you have this kind of attention cycle where you commit your where you commit your attention is reflected in your perception of reality. And then your perception of reality affects where you put your attention. And doom scrolling is an outcome that we all are becoming very familiar with. Um, doom scrolling is a term that I think is fairly recent. I heard it within the last couple of months, but it really kind of describes this act of, you know, sitting with your phone and flipping through your Facebook or Twitter feed and seeing all the really bad shit on there and kind of freaking out. I, I've actually heard doom scrolling defined as it's in its most perfect distillation, go on to our collapse on Reddit and scroll down. <laughs> so, um, Another dimension of this is that politics discovered social media. And originally it was, oh, we can raise money with social media. This was the Dean campaign uh, in uh, 2004, I think. Um, Howard Dean had a campaign where uh, they were pretty internet savvy, Joe Trippy especially. Um, and they weren't trying to control the message as much as campaigns tend to do, which people kind of liked. But their real success and what really got people excited about what they were doing was the fact that they could hold a meetup and announce the meetup and coordinate it online and have tons of people show up and give them money. And they could also get people to give them money online. So that's when the, the potential for social media to be uh, a very effective way to raise money for political campaigns was realized. But after that, in the next uh, you know, decade or so, there was another thing that was kind of brewing, which was more about, I call it here capturing souls. I know that's a bit of an overstatement, but really the idea here is that you're getting into people's heads. You're not just getting their money, but you're also drilling ideas into their skulls, basically. Uh, and remember, I said we were going to talk about suspension of disbelief again. Through media, through all of our experience with media over time, we have learned to suspend disbelief. So it's not too much of a stretch to get into our heads and get us to suspend disbelief and actually start to believe something that if we were really thinking critically, we might not otherwise have believed. So the internet kind of becomes a real Petri dish, uh, especially in 2016. We've talked about this uh, uh, quite a bit. 
uh, a petri dish for psyops and propaganda and manipulation of, of what people are thinking. And you have this whole fake news thing emerging and, and the idea of deep fakes where you can't necessarily believe even what you're seeing or what you think you're seeing. Uh, conspiracy theories and alternate realities. Uh, and the fringes are starting to gain on the mainstream, really, and they're starting to become more mainstream, uh, which is something that's been happening over time anyway. But, but really, you see that kick in now, and you, you see a, a mainstreaming of the idea that traditional media are basically corrupt and are not telling you the truth and are, are carrying an agenda of some kind. Um, that they're not just reporting facts, that they're not just reporting truth. Um, or as Giuliani said, truth isn't truth. So you, you then have memes, memes being, uh, I mean, originally memes is a Richard Dawkins term for packets of ideas, kind of like, like genes, you know, genes are code that carry information that allow the growth of something like uh, at some level a virus, but all of us, we grow from genes, you know, all of us here, we were like just a few genes originally and we grew and grew. Well, memes can grow and grow in a viral way too. What we hear people refer to as memes now are mostly those little like pictures with text overlay that are clever. But behind those things, what they carry with them is some either emotional content uh, or some sense of narrative that um, is more powerful than the little box would normally suggest. So memes are circulating and they are, uh, possibly having an impact on people. And when I say possibly, I'm not sure. And when we get to the end, I'll, I'll talk more about not being sure. But we also have cable news and 24 seven news cycles. And this is something that uh, sort of emerged from mass media and it's become a bigger and bigger thing, um, especially in the last like decade or so. Um, Cable news has become a, a form of news that is really mostly op-ed. It switches facts with opinions. They do some factual reporting, but they're heavily um, opinionated. They're, they're, there's a lot of opinion. I mean, it's become more and more like that as, as we've gone along. And the fairness doctrine had gone away. So that's sort of the end of any requirement for this idea of fairness where you have to give, you know, in any like political contest, uh, any kind of partisan discussion, both sides have to be represented. So that opens the door for things like Rush Limbaugh, Fox News, and MSNBC, and things on the left too. And also this money, money as free speech, which was the Citizens United thing, which basically said that, um, uh, political speech could be driven by more and more money. And um, um, that's certainly been the case, of course. That I, uh, I have been a little bit on the fence about, I would like to believe that money doesn't necessarily drive politics 100%, but it really seems to, you know? Other thing is that you have conspiracy theories that start to emerge from fringe thinkers. Um, question about how serious they are. I mean, you think that Alex, the people who listen to Alex Jones thinks he's really serious about what he's saying, but uh, I know that when he was in court for child support, uh, he, he was an entertainer. Uh, and that was actually uh, Rush Limbaugh's thing, too. I'm, I'm just an entertainer. Keith Oberman used to call him comedian Rush Limbaugh because of that. Uh, so these guys are supposedly entertainers, 
but they've brought fringe thinking into the mainstream and they're pushing it really hard. And uh, of course, you know, Q, QAnon is a, uh, somebody said the other day, and, and I think there's something to this, that you can't really call QAnon a conspiracy theory. You have to call it a cult. And there's all kinds of strategies that are coming into play now that we didn't really envision when we were saying, oh, the internet's going to be great. Uh, blogs are going to be great. Blogs mean that a bunch of different perspectives are going to be available and you'll be able to listen to all those different perspectives and you'll be able to figure out what you really think is true. You'll be able to piece together what the truth is and what the reality is. Man, we were so naive. That's really kind of not where we are right now. So now you have amplification, which is something comes out that's some wacky meme or idea and people are spreading it like, I mean, completely viral. Um, Steve Bannon described it as uh, flooding the system with shit, I think. You have heavy, heavy repetition of things that are not true. But if you keep saying it over and over again, it starts, you start to think, well, maybe that is true. You have psychological warfare techniques being deployed over the internet. Uh, psychological warfare is like influencing a target's value system, belief system, emotions, motives, reasoning, or behavior. You have people who are actually doing this kind of stuff online persistently, and it's working. So, solutions. How are we going to fix this? The, the recommendations I've got here, uh, you know, I said that I don't know that this talk is fully baked, and it's partly because I'm not sure that I've come up with the right solutions or enough solutions, but this is kind of what I was thinking about after going through the process of putting this outline together. Um, one is active engagement with information and misinformation. Um, if, if you think, if you're a critical thinker, let's make that assumption. You should be engaging with the stuff that you're hearing and seeing that doesn't represent critical thinking. And you should be modeling critical thinking. And you should be making an active contribution to sense making within your own individual networks. And an important point that I picked up recently about this from listening to a guy named Steve Hassan, who is a, he's a former Mooney who is now involved in like writing about cults and doing cult deprogramming himself. And he says, you know, you can't, if you're trying to pull somebody out of a cult or out of a belief system that, uh, doesn't hold up to critical thinking. You can't really challenge them. You can't tell them that they're wrong and have any appreciable effect. But he said that it can be very effective to ask questions and ask the kind of questions that will lead them into their own critical thinking that may help them think through the things that they've been told and start to understand that they've been told things that are just crazy. So how do we turn the people we know into critical thinkers? We got to do that. And uh, it could be that not everybody has the capacity for critical thinking. And if that's the case, what do we do about them? So this is kind of, uh, we're kind of at the end of my talk. And uh, this is something that I stumbled onto after I'd already been working on this. And it, got me to kind of question some of the assumptions I had. Um, this uh, link here is to an article, Five Myths About Misinformation. It's about a guy from Dartmouth College, Brendan Nyan. And uh, he challenges some of these assumptions like that we are living in echo chambers. He, he says that studies actually show that people are, are looking at things outside their own frameworks. And, and that it's not really common for people to be listening only to people who agree, agree with them or who they agree with. Consumption of news from dubious websites. 
he says it's not as widespread as, as people think it is. Uh, I think the number was like a tiny percentage, maybe 5% of people were really paying attention to those sites. Um, of course, the question, how do you define dubious website? You know, oh, and by and the I, way, I've got a typo in there. I see it websites. <laughs> I would also springboard on that, John, and say, well, how many of those mainstream sites that they're consuming are basically just reblogging stories from those dubious sites? That's a good point. Yeah. But the real question is whether, whether people are, are, are consuming um, fake news in large quantities and he thinks not. Uh, did a propaganda campaign result in Donald Trump's election? Uh, there's a lot of us who were pretty convinced that, the Russians came in and they used their uh, tricky KGB propaganda tactics, their psychological warfare tactics to convince a bunch of people to vote for Donald Trump. But there's a lot of reasons that people voted for Donald Trump. And it probably wasn't that. That probably didn't have as much impact as we think it did. And we probably ought to rethink that and start looking at all the other things that might have driven people to do that. And some of you may say, well, what's wrong with that? I voted for Donald Trump. And, you know, sorry if I seem to be negative about Trump. Um, I am a little bit. Are there people so entrenched that they don't respond to fact checks? There was a, a piece of information floating around that I believe was, was from a study that said that they had shown that people who are confronted with actual facts that differed from their opinions would become more entrenched in their opinions. And uh, Nihan is saying that there are other studies that sort of debunk that, that it's not really common for people to disregard fact checks, that if you actually show somebody facts that contradict a, an assumption they have, they, they are more apt to change their mind than we thought they were. And then this whole question about whether we're in a post-truth era, but that really, I mean, what does post-truth mean? I mean, we can still get a consensus. We can still agree about things. Uh, and the real question is, how do we do that? And how do we become, how do we bring everybody sort of into the same conversation. And right now we have this, this polarization that is uh, significant. So Plutopia, that's the end of my talk. And I'm just gonna mention one other thing about Plutopia, which is that we have a radio show, which Scoop and I do every Wednesday from two to four. And we'll be doing it tomorrow. And it's not talk radio, we're actually playing music. So two to four tomorrow, if you're just sitting around wondering what to listen to, you can find the link at plutopia.io. Uh, it's in the, the right sidebar. Uh, there's a link to the Plutopia radio show, which is called Radio Free Plutopia. So that was my last shameless plug. Well, thank you very much, John. As always, a bunch of interesting, uh, thought-provoking stuff. I think I'll go ahead and uh, break the ice to kick off the discussion because I have a couple little questions for you, but I'm going to encourage everyone who wants to ask John a question to do so. I guess so we don't have a stampede, I'll encourage you to type your question in the chat if you have a question, though, you know, if, if you feel like being brave and jumping in and unmuting, you know, as long as we don't have a stampede, it'll be fine, but... I encourage the chat just because it will probably help keep things a little more orderly when we have over 30 people in here. Um, my two questions for you, John. Yes. I notice a, my first question is I notice among a lot of people a very disturbing tendency <laughs> to conflate questioning traditional narratives or facts or explanations with being a critical thinker that they think the two are the same thing. Now, I think you and I both agree they're not. And so I'm curious if you have thoughts about for the kind of person who thinks they are the same thing, 
how we might get them to maybe understand better. Just because you're questioning the popular explanation of something does not equate to necessarily being a critical thinker. And I guess my second question for you is sort of a long view of history thing where it was sparked by my, you know, you talking about the origins of mass media with the printing press. And I, I thought it was a especially resonant example given our current situation, but also a potentially very disturbing example where, yes, the printing press was sort of the first mass media the world was ever exposed to. And, you know, the first thing that it really did was, you know, they printed a bunch of copies of the Bible, which had previously been a fairly rare book because, you know, all books were rare because they were laborious and hard to reproduce. Suddenly, there were now tons of copies of the Bible everywhere. And traditionally, because the Bible had been rare, possibly the only copy in a town might have been the local Catholic priest's copy. But suddenly, ordinary people could have their own Bible. They started reading it. They started realizing the priest didn't always tell us what was actually in the book. And so the Catholic Church is sort of the authority for truth broke down. And there's a lot of historians who basically straight up say that the invention of mass media, the printing press, eventually led to the European religious wars and the Thirty Years' War because it democratized truth and broke down this central source of truth authority. I guess my question for you is, does history repeat? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good point. This isn't exactly a completely new thing. Um, gosh, that was making me think about how um, Harari and Sapiens talks about how agriculture is really what screwed us. If we hadn't done agriculture, we'd still be very happy hunter gatherers, you know, scampering around. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that is a good point. Um, and, and part of the problem is that technologies have consequences and they almost always have unforeseen consequences. And um, actually both of the things you've just asked me um, make me think back to some conversations I had with Howard Rheingold, who has uh, done a lot of thinking and writing about some of these things. Um, and um, one of the things that he talked about, I guess I'll talk about the second thing first, the latest thing, um, technology is having consequences that I, I think at one time in the US, we had an office that basically reviewed evolving and new technologies for like impact assessment. And we don't have anything like that now. And there's a question about whether that's something that we really should have. Uh, but then there's a lot of related questions to that, like how do they, how do they know what is happening in technology? How, how broad can their purview be? And what action can they take? Well, the most obvious action would be just to try to see with some level of strategic foresight to see the, um, uh, implications of the technologies and what might result from the technologies that the people developing them might not have considered. Because I can tell you, those of us who were early internet adopters were, were dewy-eyed and, and wore rose-colored glasses and thought everything was great. And we didn't think of it. And it was right in front of us. I mean, when we were doing fringeware in the early 90s, we had people like distributing crazy conspiracy theory stuff. And I thought they were just being ironic, you know, just being funny, like subgenius, you know. Uh, but some of it was very serious stuff. And there's also money in it, as, as Alex Jones has proved. Well, not everybody realized Discordianism was a parody. <laughs> exactly. And then you, you asked uh, the thing about um, critical thinking. Um, it's this is a hard thing. Uh, back then, back in the nineties, uh, when I was having these conversations with Howard, and, and later than that too, uh, we were also talking about 
how essential it was for people to learn digital literacy. But really what we were talking about was not just digital literacy, but critical thinking. That people learn how to <clears throat> not just understand the technologies and how they work and how they might be affecting them, but also to understand how to question what they were seeing, especially as, as there were so many more potential ways to have inputs into your thinking, you know? How do you think, how do you get people to think critically? And I noticed there was something on here about aren't the methods of scientific debate good enough for filtering out junk? And yeah, but how do you get people to learn and use the methods of scientific debate? It's one thing to say we need to have uh, digital literacy programs in elementary schools, but how do you get that to happen? It hadn't happened. As far as I know, it's not common to have a, a, a digital literacy or critical thinking taught in elementary school. I mean, I mean yeah, you know, and it, it particularly I, I notice online that there are certain forms of fallacy that seem to pop up a lot, like like people being like, I don't know, I frankly, I'd say possibly ad hominems, the one I see abused the most, were just I, a common argumentative tactic I will see people take online is you'll try to persuade them of something, they don't want to believe it, you'll provide them sources to believe it, and then they'll basically say, that source lied this one time, ergo, everything they've ever said is a lie. <laughs> You know, one of the common things that I've found myself doing in debates with people who um, are proposing, um, especially recently, some of the ideas about the election, the Hunter Biden laptop, all those kinds of things, is to look at, there's a site called Media Bias Fact Check, and there's other similar sites where they will give you kind of a good read on whether a, a a, a media source has bias or not and just say, well, look, what you're looking at has uh, a known media bias and it's failed a bunch of fact checks. So do you really want to believe that? You know, is that really a credible source? I mean, I, I agree with you that'll work on some people though, you know, it didn't work on the people I was talking to. You, well, yeah, I mean, I was going to say it's it's become a meme in certain circles, even that there are people who reflexively for things like Snopes or Media Matters, you know, they'll immediately dismiss it and basically say, oh, that's secretly owned by insert people I don't like, so I can ignore yeah. everything it says. Snopes is run by well, a bunch of liberals. Can I make a quick point? Uh, I asked the question about the scientific method. Uh, I used to live in the Dallas area. In fact, I lived in Irving, uh, not far from where uh, a certain person uh, associated with the mother of all conspiracies used to live. Uh, so, <laughs> I have no idea who you're talking about. <laughs> people who like, you know, yeah, who kind of get wrapped up around the axle over these issues. And frankly, the con conclusion I came to is there are certain people who are so far down the rabbit hole, it is not possible to, you know, extricate them without some, you know, professional uh, cult deprogramming type methods. And that's a job for professionals. <laughs> I became convinced it is better to try to get others from falling into that rabbit hole. And even when you are debating these, you know, like uh, basically true believers, it might not be a bad idea to actually th keep in background that the, your real audience is those who are sitting at the edge of that, uh, you know, uh, yeah, that uh, rabbit hole and stop them from uh, falling into it. And at the end of the day, the best way to do that is, you know, uh, to follow the rules of evidence. Uh, this need not be the pure scientific method, but I mean, you know, uh, basic common sense that, you know, anybody who has uh, even a high school education, ideally a college education with some work in the sciences, they should be able to recognize. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, uh, what are you going to do if people seem to have failed to develop common sense? And we got a number of other interesting questions for you here, John. Hey, I, there's a question I want to respond to okay. right away while I'm looking right at it from okay. Matt Whitman, uh, where it says, do you think the idea of question authority has taken on more of a political slant 
are more of a right slant than a counterculture left leaning. And that is actually, when I was first talking about calling this question authority, that was kind of what was in my head was that the, the question authority meme that we had been uh, putting on the bumpers of cars back in the 60s has really led, I think it's led to kind of what we have now where we have people who question all authority, the deep state, you know, all that crap. I mean, um, that's well, where it and, started. And like, I mean, we had a profound mistrust of the deep state when I was a hippie in my early 20s. Uh, we were talking about the same kind of stuff, but we were talking about it from the left. And now the right's talking about the same thing. And now I find myself, um, and I'm not, I'm kind of more of a centrist, but I'm still, I'm kind of like, wait, the deep state isn't so bad. I mean, I learned about the deep state. I learned that there's a lot of, you know, positive good that comes out of the deep state. But then also we know that there's a lot of horrible stuff that came out of the deep state. I guess part of the answer here is that there's things that the left and right could really agree about that they're not really agreeing about right now. And suddenly you find people on the, I mean, people on the left used to think the FBI was like uh, just a few steps away from Satan. And now, you know, it's like, Oh, we should listen to the FBI because you know, they've got Donald Trump's number. Well, yeah, you're, you're getting actually, into a pet peeve of mine, John. I frequently get frustrated at a lot of my fellow people on the left where I'm like, why are we suddenly trusting the FBI and NSA? It, it's well, interesting. I mean, <laughs> the problem is that we have to look at our privilege and we have to look at how we live as well as we do here in the USA. And part of it is because we have screwed over other people in other parts of the world and uh we got to come to terms with that and we're tearing the planet up you know we're like uh living in a way that is totally not sustainable and kind of unwilling to admit it uh it's almost impossible for us to reverse climate change because it would require such a, a, a well i shouldn't say that uh, I've been taking a task on this before. We would have to radically change the way that we live, but we could do it and we'd be still okay. But we're not doing it. We're not addressing that. We're not, we're not uh, questioning the level of privilege that, that we've had. We're not questioning what we've done to people in our own country that have traditionally been oppressed. There's so much shit that we're not doing. And question authority was kind of about that. And the left was doing it and the right was doing it. But really, when the left was saying question authority, when the right was saying question authority, they're still just kind of allowing this, this stuff to exist that is that's what we really should be questioning. And we should be doing it together. We should somehow figure out how to bring everybody together to question how we manage to sustain human life on this planet in a way that everybody will be okay. And we're not doing that. And I, I do think there, John, that you, you do actually get to, I think, maybe some of the real underlying truth here, which is that even though uh, you would believe it very differently from uh, the stories we hear both from mainstream and fringe media, that there's probably a lot more ideological agreement than a lot of people I think often really sit down and think and realize. I think, I think the left and right actually do still agree a lot on the basics of the problems in this world. And, you know, even who some of the bad actors have caused those problems are. But I think a lot of the disagreement comes from the narrative we built around what do we do about it? And I don't know how to solve that, but, you know. <laughs> Plus, I'm sitting here reading questions. Yeah, we have a lot of interesting questions. I know. I'm seeing a bunch of stuff on here. There's, a, there's some as comments. There's some really good stuff on here. Um, I don't think we should just read out the comments. I'm trying to f find what is actually a question. Uh, oh, 
Here's one that just asked if the slides and recording are going to be available. And yes, in fact, uh, the Plutopia News Network will be publishing those for sure uh, on our site as a podcast. I believe, Scoop, is that correct? We're going to make a podcast out of this? Absolutely. And we'll be uh, also selling the uh, John Lubkowski bobblehead dolls in our gift shop. <laughs> And in addition to that, it'll be on YouTube. And I think EFF Austin will put it out too, or do you want us well, to just do it? I mean, um, certainly, um, I guess what I'll say, uh, George, is we certainly can get the, uh, I can have John send the slides file individually for anybody who wants the slides. But I mean, we'll, we'll on our YouTube channel, we'll put up this talk. So you should be able to review it anytime you want. Um, and, we need and to remember to grab the uh, comments too. Um, and, and yeah, those posted that's, I may, I may have not been being super rigorous about making sure they've been getting saved so far, but that's a good point. Speaking that we have a representative of the history center here, got to be good about archiving and, and, and yeah, you know, John reminded me in a shameless, uh, plug for merchandise. I'll just say that if you don't want to just give EFF Austin money, we also have merch you can order from us. If you go to our website, we have an online store where local company Bumper Active will make you an EFF Austin mug or t-shirt or bumper sticker. And uh, those funds go to us. So yeah, you should order that if you're so inclined. Swag. <laughs> I see here that, is Carl still on the call? Oh, Carl's still here. Okay. I I see that he says he's a Marxist and still doesn't trust the FBI or the CIA. But my question is whether uh, whether it's Groucho or Carl. <laughs> I've always been more into Groucho myself, but sorry, Carl. <laughs> Oops. So I'm still looking to see what actual well, questions we I think have. there's an interesting question from uh, Newt here. Is there a okay. set of tools for productive thinking while questioning authority? Well, while respecting authority is what he says. Oh, yes, respecting. So yes, hmm. the word yeah, choice I, is important. So my point with that is that um, respecting authority is a comfort for many people in life. And um, amongst conservative people specifically that is a way of thinking and living a life uh, that's much more common uh, much more popular than with uh, progressive or, or leftist people in the sense that the traditional family model where the father is sort of the authority figure you know, provides security um, and a level of comfort because the authority will do the thinking and will do the decision making and will provide comfort and security so um, does one have to be outside that frame of mind to make sense of uh, bullshit on the internet? <laughs> That's a great question. I'd have to chew on that. <laughs> and, and, you know, and it's interesting when, I, whenever, I'll be honest, whenever we have conversations in general about like media bias and disinformation, I, I always, whenever like there's some academic study that purports to be like, this is the way that like, you know, liberals think, and this is the way conservatives think. I always have this slight little bullshit detector in my brain go off where I'm like, well, most of these studies are being written by people who are probably a bit on the left. So I can't help but wonder how biased these explanations are. I don't know. Gee, you know, what I started thinking about was how there's such a diversity of experience that people have from, you know, kind of the minute that they are born and, you know, while they're raised in their formative years, uh, some people uh, live with parents who are pretty rough on them and others with parents who are, are um, um, encouraging, uh, some with parents who are not so rough, but discouraging. There's a whole diversity of formative experience that plays out through somebody's life. And that means that people are really very different because they've all had such different experiences. And it also means, uh, or there is also the fact that, uh, as I think part of the point I was making is that there's a lot of stuff being dumped into our heads. I mean, we are a product of all the things that we have experienced and seen and heard all the words we've heard, a lot of the voices in our head are not really 
us, but they're people that we've heard sort of being recycled through our heads as thinking. There's your Buddhist coming out, John. The, yeah, uh, the that, me in it. my head is not me. <laughs> the me in my head is not me. Um, and in fact, it's empty. But when you think about that, it's a real challenge to figure out how you get people with such diverse backgrounds on the same page. And, you know, we talked about like scientific method or whatever. It's really about like trying to get at the truth of something without bias and regardless of um, uh, various conditions. But you kind of, you're trying to see what's real here. And in Buddhism, that's a lot of what it is, is that you're, you're watching your experience and you're watching your mind and you're trying to understand what's real here. And that's really kind of what we're talking about here. What's real here? Uh, this talk, uh, the title of it was about the end of reality, but we really, it's not so much that reality is ending, but that it's so fragmented right now uh, into so many different perspectives. And some of those perspectives are finding it hard to cohere in a meaningful way. And that kind of has to happen for, for the sake of the survival of the species, really. We have to cohere. We have to learn to be uh, with each other. I guess I'll just say quick aside, as far as uh, the, what I, the title I gave John's talk, you know, aside from the obvious, um, you know, um, Marquez joke in the title. Um, the end of reality is a phrase to give full credit that EFF Austin friend and Future Fossils podcast host Michael Garfield coined. Uh, Michael Garfield is a paleontologist by training who also kind of moonlights as a psychedelic futurist. Um, very smart guy. And yeah. end of reality is the phrase he coined to really describe what we kind of hinted at in this talk and what John talked about a little bit, but the coming epistemological crisis uh, that deep fakes are going to cause that basically the things we see in here we can't know if they're real anymore that basically we're all trapped in a philip k dick novel but it's real we're all functional schizophrenics suddenly <laughs> yeah and you know when when uh question authority and, and yes bumper this is sticker, schroeder's cat to the uh, chat question oh yeah. when question authority <laughs> appeared as a bumper sticker and had been around for a while another bumper sticker appeared that said question reality and in fact i used to have a bumper sticker that said i break for hallucinations but that's another point do we have another question in there that we haven't answered yet there, there's several you could probably grab. We're having a very active chat room. <laughs> I know. Uh, I'm just reading one thing here from George that says, I was with you on seeing the early internet through rose-colored glasses. I saw it as the best instantiation of the First Amendment, and everyone could have their own soapbox. I thought that the best ideas would percolate to the top and fringe things would die. I think of the old Chinese proverb curse, be careful what you ask for. And that, that is so exactly it. I mean, it's, it's like we really, we didn't really know what kind of assumptions to make. We didn't know what we didn't know about what, what was happening as we evolved the internet. And really the early internet was, uh, was kind of like that, you know, everybody could have their own soapbox, would speak out, everybody was pretty civil. You didn't have wars at first, but then you started to have flame wars. It was really a big deal when, when people started fighting online and, and they gave it the name Flame Wars. Mark Deary wrote a book called Flame Wars. Um, and we were kind of astonished by that, but that was like, oh, this is the worst it's gonna get. But then we had trolls. Trolls started to appear. And uh, trolls, I guess, are kind of uh, precursors of some of the more outlandish things that we see now. Um, certainly people are doing what I guess you would refer to as political trolling in a really big way right now. I mean, we have such an uncivil 
political environment online. If the right and the left meet online, there's almost always a kind of explosion, you know? Yeah, and it it seems like when this happens, just critical thinking, you know, shuts down. Like I frequently, even with right. people who I'm technically on their side, sometimes I'll just, I watch the way they're behaving online and I just want to be like, I don't want to be associated with these people. It's a civil war, but it's a cold war so far. Well, uh, so just quickly, one other quick question. I mean, uh, uh, this might sound strange coming from me, who's like a you know very pro science and education person, but uh, I feel that uh, there has been too much of an emphasis on STEM education to the detriment of uh, liberal arts and humanities. So, in, in other words, people don't have the uh, mindset or the tools to sift through rhetoric. And uh, basically, rhetoric is a very, you know, I mean, it is one of the three foundations of uh, classical education, the trivium. And uh, rhetoric is actually kind of almost a curse word. But I mean, if you look at like the debates that uh, Lincoln and Douglas had before the Civil War or the writings of uh, Thoreau, I mean, those people were far more uh, capable of getting a point across and having a debate for hours on end. I mean, if you look at the, you know, absurd so-called debates that occur now, I mean, uh, you know, it's like a shameful thing. But the point being that, uh, I mean, I really feel that it would be helpful for people to, you know, be able to detect things like irony and, uh, uh, you know, me metaphors and paradoxes and, uh, you know, I mean, to be able to tell that, yeah, sometimes, you know, words can have different meanings. Uh, but, uh, very quickly, you know, things become like a kind of a question of fact-checking, and that has its own biases. So anyways, to me, you know, it might be more worthwhile to, you know, look at the world through a more um, philosophical and literary lens instead of trying to force-feed everybody to, you know, go through the STEM method for evaluating the world, the, you know, scientific way. And again, I'm a completely pro-science, so believe me, I have no axe to grind, but uh, I still feel that, yeah, I mean, you know, there's a bit of a uh, kind of a possibly a chasm was created when you know kids were uh, basically you know you can teach them only so much and if they're just uh, learning you know chemical equations and quadratic equations and uh, not having time to read uh, you know things where they can uh, actually you know use language which is a very powerful tool then uh, that's a real you know uh, something that's not going to end well. So just curious, what might be your comments? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, we were talking about uh, how it would be great to be teaching critical thinking more broadly. And really, if you're teaching people rhetoric and teaching people debate, you're also going to be teaching them critical thinking. And, you know, implied. and, you know, somebody who both has a degree in bioengineering and English, I absolutely second your point. And I, I think there's definitely way too many people who science can teach us how to make sense of the world, but it can't provide answers for what it means to live a good, fulfilling life. Science can't give you that answer. And I think too many people forget this. I, you know, I went to a fairly prestigious science school for college, and I'll tell you, it's kind of concerning the number of people in the alumni group of the school who frankly are flirting with almost eugenics as far as their beliefs when it comes to certain things. And so I look at that and just go, yeah, these people really could have used more humanities and less engineering classes. I see people who, I see people who get mad when you point out that like, a lot of people want to like view science as somehow divorced from people and apolitical, you know, they're like, it's objective. And I'm like, no, uh, technology is always political because it is always put to uses by human beings. You cannot separate the two, but this seems to escape a lot of people who just think science is this objective mathematical platonic form independent of human society and it it never is and i think until more people get that we're gonna you know continue to run into these problems yes indeed and uh i was reading here where washington said 
Um, well, have I lost it? Uh, to Sam's point, I feel the degradation of conversation is more the result of the easy amplification of bad voices now that would have been lost in earlier generations. And uh, that's a good point that we have so many voices now that are, are emerging into some kind of public view. We're hearing from people that used to just not say anything, you know, and uh, we're starting to hear things that actually, frankly, shock us. And uh, um, it doesn't mean that people weren't thinking those thoughts before. We just weren't hearing them. And there's actually an advantage there. I mean, it's good. It's good to have everything on the table, right? It's good to be able to see and know what people are thinking. It's like, think about these, like, I mean, we think about it, these militia guys with their guns and how dangerous they are. And, and uh, wow, what are we going to do about those guys? Well, they were there before. We didn't know they were there. Now we know they're there because they're building their websites. You know, they're putting themselves online. They're showing up in places. So if you've got people out there who um, are, I'm trying to think of a good word for it, error prone in some way, you know, who are going down a path that maybe requires some input and feedback from the rest of us, ain't going to happen unless you know they're there and, and now we're more aware of them. Yeah. So. And, and, you know, I'll, I'll say that, you know, this is, you know, one of my hobbies is studying a lot of history and, you know, one one thing that I learned a couple of years ago, which, you know, we talk about, you know, nothing's truly unprecedented to uh, call out the chat there. But, you know, one could argue that these are not even anywhere near the most um, fraught times as far as the majority of people believing misinformation straight up falsehood. Because one one thing I, I learned a few years ago about about British history and what people in Britain used to believe their history was, the truth is that from about 1000 AD to 1500 AD in Britain, they like thought that the wizard Merlin was a real person who had lived. Like they absolutely believed he was a historical figure as real as Alexander the Great. And you furthermore, mean he wasn't? no. And furthermore, they believed this whole fake alternative history of Britain that was completely made up. Like actually Shakespeare's King Lear, King Lear was one of these fake ancient British kings that they all believed was real for like 500 years. Um, yeah, so like for literally 500 years, the country of Britain, and I mean everyone, even the king and the smartest people, all believed a completely fictional version of their country's history that only finally collapsed when some smart people in the 1500s went, wait, there's no actual historical evidence any of these people ever existed. Well, this gets to that suspension of disbelief thing too. And I think I may have given a talk about this at, at EFF Austin actually, uh, about how science fiction has affected us and how um we sort of believe in time travel and interplanetary travel and um i don't know i mean the whole set of things diving through a wormhole to get to another universe there's a lot of things that we sort of take for granted are probably true and real because we've read them so often over and over again in fiction Fiction sort of sets us up to have beliefs that we might not otherwise have even considered and or that we might have rejected as being, oh, this just couldn't be. And there's pros and cons to that, but one thing that does is it sort of opens you up to believe other kinds of fiction. So you may believe, for instance, Q drops. You may start looking at this QAnon stuff and, you know, you've sort of been taught to read these things and maybe to look for patterns and those people are definitely looking for patterns and trying to identify patterns in the reality around them and some of us suspect that what they're seeing is kind of 
I mean, their ideas are crazy, but we can kind of see how they got there, right? We understand how people can find their way into a belief system that is strange. And part of it is that we've all sort of opened ourselves up to that to some extent, just because of the fact that we have been taught to appreciate fiction, that we've watched a bazillion movies. I mean, what what's going on in your head if if you've spent several years looking at mostly slasher movies? It doesn't kind of tend to make you a slasher. What it might do is tend to make you kind of afraid that a slasher is going to show up and crawl through your window, though. Well, you know, you know, you know I'm sure you know, it doesn't at all affect people's minds that you turn on the 10 p.m. local news and it's nothing but story after story of how somebody got murdered, you're going to die. And Jennifer never never mind that point. murders are really rare. Never mind that. Jennifer reminds us of zombies. <laughs> zombies are another thing. I mean, how many zombies have you seen you know, on television and in movies? And not like the the cool voodoo zombies like we used to see in like I walk with a zombie, but <laughs> you know, the high tech like viral zombies that, that we've been seeing since uh, George Romero and you know, zombies are like a common metaphor now. And they're so common to see the zombie metaphor that I'm, I'm guessing a few of us halfway believe that the zombie thing could happen or that it could be real. Well, you're, you're actually dancing dangerously close to a weird philosophical thought that's hit me at times, which is, I frankly think it's kind of remarkable the number of things that used to be completely fictional that humans thought was fantasy or sci-fi or just made it up that humans eventually figured out how to do. Like, you know, there's ancient stories where humans gain the power of flight what are the odds that flight was actually possible, you know? And you can name dozens of technologies we've invented where they appeared as purely fictional powers of the gods before we figured out how to do it. What were the odds that everything we made up was actually possible? I don't know. It's just one of those, like, you know, high at 3 a.m. thoughts I have sometimes. Yeah, and just getting back around to the real point of this, the real point of this is to understand that we have a um, uh, a kind of odd relationship to the sense of reality. Um, in fact, our perceptions don't show us everything. You know, you, you can't see every color, you can't hear every sound. Um, so there's a lot that we don't see and there's a lot that we don't know. Um, and then we have a lot of things that we make up. We have a lot of narratives that we run through our heads and they're influenced by narratives we're exposed to factual and fictional. And we got to kind of come to terms with that. We got to really think about what really is real and to what extent is reality a consensus uh, a consensus of, you know, some collective imagining and to what extent is there really a phenomenological reality that I could uh, assume is out there? You know, I, you don't really see it exactly. I mean, sight is just taking inputs and kind of constructing something in internally that gives you a representation of the world, but it's not the world itself. Uh, same with sounds and touch and all the senses that we have. So we're in, we're in a position where our confidence in what's real is probably overstated. And we really need to think hard about that, I think, from time to time. Yeah, though, you know, I, I think what's interesting is I think almost everyone with a few exceptions on all sides of the ideological spectrum, I think we would all grant that, yeah, we're probably delusional and biased and believe incorrect things about certain things. We, we all grant that and all realize it has to be true. I think, though, we would all very much disagree about which things those were that were the delusional things. 
And I also think most of us have hard pressed to take it out of the abstract and be like, what's something delusional I actually believe? Most of us would suddenly struggle to name a specific thing. We got any other cool questions, John, we want to address? We don't technically get kicked out of the room like Cat Factory, but I don't want to overstay our welcome if people are getting bored, but there's no technical cutoff. Hmm, is the volume of information inputs that humans take on still increasing? Hmm, I would say yes. Um, certainly increasing for me, I'm seeing more and more stuff. If that's what you're thinking about, uh, I actually have uh, an information overload. And I think many of you may have that too. Um, I have so much stuff coming in um, that it's really more than I can really completely process. Not consistently, but, you know, quite a bit. Uh, it's been quite a bit that way lately. And I'm aware of it. And uh, I'm kind of having to live with the fact that there's a lot of stuff where I don't have a high confidence that I really understand what's happening. You know? Yeah, I guess to your question, do we have a limit? Well, I don't know where it hits me is I I maybe can talk to I'm blue in the face about that you need to be a critical thinker. And I mean, really be a critical thinker. When somebody makes a claim, you investigate it, do a variety of sources, track it down yourself, figure out if there's things backing up the assertions in there. It's like, you know, I, I'll tell you to do that and that you should do it. But the truth is, I'm exposed to so many new things every day that involve me having to take 15 entities on their word on something. I don't follow my own advice on most things. Like I, I remember I, I literally like to use a recent example that you alluded to a little bit, John, when that like Hunter Biden laptop thing happened, I literally threw up my hands where I was just like, I don't have the energy to research if there's any validity to this and track down who's lying and who's not lying. I don't have the time. Yeah, I mean, there's time is, is certainly one limitation that we have and bandwidth and just limitations to our understanding. But uh, the thing that strikes me about it is I don't, I wouldn't know of a way to quantify what the limits are. But I do suspect that people are operating beyond their limits, that they're being exposed to so much stuff that they're, um, among other things, losing some of it and misunderstanding some of it. And uh, that's, that's an issue we really didn't even talk about or get into. And I didn't really think about it, but actually that's an important part of the, of the problem. It's, a, it's another factor is that, because we have, I mean, we have 24 seven news feeds. We have, um, you know, instead of getting the morning paper in the morning and 15 minutes of NBC news at night, we have uh, Apple news. We have Google news. Actually, I'm talking about myself. I have a bunch of news things set up. I have a, an RSS feed reader. I mean, I have tons and tons of inputs. And some of them are curated and they're supposedly curated uh, with some idea of what I'd be interested in. But what it really adds up to is a, a kind of matrix of stories that are very sort of diverse and uh, sometimes even conflicting. And the effect that has on my sense making, I don't really have straight. I mean, and I'm, you know, I'm a meditator. I, I probably deal with it uh, better because of that. But by the same token, uh, I think it is worthwhile to be concerned about the amount of information that you're being hit with and how well you can actually, A, make sense of it and B, find truth in it. You know, I... I will also just to our few questions in the chat about are with this information overload, are we approaching the singularity and what does it mean for the whole 
sense making post truth discussion of our talk. Um, I, I guess I'll just all I want to say on it is I'll refer you to a very uh, fun little short story I was exposed to in college uh, by the writer Borges called the uh, Library of Babel. It's one. It's very short, and it's one of the best parables. I've ever found for the epistemological problem, the sense-making problem, the knowledge problem that a world of infinite data represents. It's basically, the story is almost a thought experiment where Borges pretends that there's a world where there's basically an infinite library full of hexagonal rooms that are infinitely tiled into infinity and the hexagons are infinitely tall and every wall of all the hexagons in this space are filled with infinitely tall bookcases with infinite books and there's like you know he he has a little flimsy plot of like some order of monks who like wander through this infinite maze looking for knowledge and the truth and the secret of life and the universe and everything but the implication of that there's infinite books in here is very profound which is that somewhere in that library is a book with like your entire life story in it uh, your past your present and your future and it's all correct but it's just by pure chance because every possible combination of letters is somewhere in this library. So somewhere in the library is a book that will tell you your future, but you'll never find it because it's an infinite library and it's all just random data. And the whole point of the story is, well, in a world of infinite data, is knowledge even a thing anymore? Is it even possible? So I'd really recommend reading that if you want a guy thinking about the implications of the singularity long before anybody thought of the singularity as an idea. What is it called again? Uh, the Library of Babel ah. by, by the Argentinian writer Borges. Um, you know, I'm, it looks like we're getting close to probably where we'd run out of time. And, and I think mm -hmm. a good uh, last thing that I would like to just read from the, the chat is uh, from Jim Chuck. Okay. And it says, we are buried beneath the weight of information, which is being confused with knowledge. Quantity is being confused with abundance and wealth with happiness. We are monkeys with money and guns. And that's from Tom Waits. I wonder how long till we're going to have to wait for him to type out Shakespeare for us. I don't have a gun, by the way. <laughs> I can answer that question. It's not an infinite number of monkeys. I mean, one hairless monkey did it in 40 years without a typewriter. <laughs> That's a good point, actually. A, a real hairless monkey in 40 years wrote all those works. <laughs> there you are. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming. This has been a very wide-ranging, very interesting discussion. I don't know if we've solved the epistemological problems of our time, but I certainly think we all at least are more equipped to engage with them more critically than maybe we were before we all had this discussion. Yeah, oh, I've been, no, I've been told we've solved me. it. Okay, we solved it. Never mind then. We, we did it, everyone. <laughs> Thanks Thank for you. having me. This was fun. Thank you all so much for coming. We always all appreciate your support. EFF Austin is a community and we would not exist without all of you. So thank you all for attending. I, uh, I look forward to the day that we can all meet again in person. That will be eagerly awaited till then. I hope you'll keep coming to our virtual events and um, to any virtual parties like the holiday one that we'll put together. And um, do continue to come to us. If, if there are issues in Austin in this space that uh, you become aware of that you want us working on, because I can promise you, you know, it's, it's easy to lose track of the outside world given how little many of us are getting out, but um, there are, these issues continue to pop up in Austin and elsewhere. Um, and they continue to affect people's lives and be important. So um, let us know if there's something going on in Austin that you would like us to turn our gaze on and try to bring some accountability to. Um, but once again, thank you all. And um, we'll see you next month or at the book club, which is sooner than that. You don't even have to wait a month. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everyone.